and I'm director of the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development. I'm your moderator today. And as moderator, I'll be monitoring the chat box and if folks have questions as we move through the talk, um, I'll be looking at that and make sure that the presenters have a chance to respond to those in a timely way. We have uh, four presenters today on this topic, uh, Felix Fernando and Lynette Flage from North Dakota State University, and Janad and Jeffrey Jacquet from South Dakota State University. And with that, I think I'll just turn it over to our presenters. All right, thank you, Scott. This is Lynette Flage, and I'm going to start us off this morning. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar regarding kind of a, a, an interesting challenge that we've been facing in Western North Dakota and Western South Dakota, really that housing issue as the Bakken region has been developed. I see many from the North Dakota Housing and Finance Agency on today, and so I thank them for that. I know that they've been addressing this challenge for some time now. This particular study is really um, about you know, what's happened in western North Dakota around the um, oil development. And for the past eight years, there's been just some huge changes in North Dakota as well as some parts of South Dakota because of these advances in hydraulic fracturing, um, horizontal drilling. It's made North Dakota the second largest oil producing state in the country in just a very, very short time. And with all of that oil drilling has come a lot of great activity. There's been many more jobs. A lot of people have come to our state. It's been a very exciting time. But at the same time, it's brought a lot of challenges, such as increased traffic, crime. You know, some, some of the student population growth has been a good thing, but at times it's been a challenge. And in this case, we're really going to talk about housing shortages. There's, there's a housing shortage um, challenge in that part of the state, and many of you have likely heard about this. The purpose of our study is really to, the study that we did, and it was over the summer, was to look at the housing conditions, especially for essential service workers. And those would be people that were there for law enforcement, uh, maybe government employees, teachers in the K-12 system, those people that weren't directly related to the oil industry, but those people that had an indirect um, relationship, certainly, with that industry. We looked at three communities in North Dakota and three communities in South Dakota. And you'll see them listed. The communities of Watford City and Ray are actually right in the thick of things. They're right in the center, probably Bakken Central. And, um, and so you'll hear some of the data that came from information on all of these communities. This graphic shows the population change. Um, over kind of that eight year up to 2013, we can get the latest data, but the population changes and how quickly and dramatically things did change. Um, Watford City is that community in the blue right at the beginning, and that one, again, is really right in the center part of the Bakken development, and it has dr increased dramatically in population. Our three South Dakota communities have certainly increased as well a bit. Um, they were, have been on the periphery of a lot of this development, and their housing challenges have been there as well. So we really wanted to take a look at what's happened in these communities. The process that um, Felix and Anne actually really immersed themselves in the region over the summer and did a lot of interviews in those six communities from many different groups, um, real estate agencies, management companies, builders, public and city administrators, local business owners, really asked a lot of questions about what is the housing like, um, what can be done, what are some opportunities um, for this region in the future. There have been a lot of things that have been done as far as housing development goes out there. It's been great. The state has provided a lot of assistance. Like I said, the North Dakota Housing and Finance Agency has been there. Um, in full force. Everybody is really working hard to make things happen. Um, but this particular study will show a bit more about, I'm getting an echo now, sorry. It's going to show a bit more about what um, some of the other options are that have been looked at in Felix, other regions can you mute? as well. Felix, can you mute your mic? There we go. There we go. Thank you. And actually, I'm going to um, turn the slides now over to Anne, who will get on to the, um, the next 
topic. You're going to see a lot of pictures this morning and just some of the things that Ann and Felix discovered. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, the existing housing cycles in the Bakken region before getting into some um, some examples. So we identified three phases of housing development in the Bakken region, and each of these phases had different characteristics and different dominant um, housing types. So in the first phase, we really see this dramatic influx of workers. These are primarily young males seeking employment. Um, this generates an amazing, uh, an immediate housing demand that's not easily satisfiable by the quality and quantity of available housing stock in these communities. So industries pursue housing solutions that can satisfy growing needs quickly, and housing developers and suppliers focus on workforce housing, so things like man camps, um, other temporary options like trailers, campers, and hotels. So most, um, if not all, of the available single and multifamily housing units in communities um, in this first phase are secured by oil development and related support industries for workforce housing as well. So we're really seeing this industry drive to secure housing increases rent on all housing types, which um, it really incentivizes investors and builders to construct um, permanent housing. So we um, we also see at the same in this first phase that land value rapidly increases with demand as well. But at the same time, um, a sizable portion of the workforce, uh, like usually those involved with drilling and hydraulic fracturing operations, they remain largely transient. So demand for workforce housing doesn't really slow until industry transitions from drilling to production. Um, so in the second phase, we really see uh, developers and investors focus more on multifamily units to both capitalize on higher rents, but also provide higher quality housing options for a growing for the growing workforce. So, um, as like apartments, single family units become available, um, the workforce transitions from the you know the more the temporary to the more permanent types of housing. Um, also during this phase, hotel and other uh, temporary housing rental rates start to decline a bit, and housing ownership transitions from company-owned to leased or um, to owner-occupied. And we also see in this second phase, uh, industry um, focusing more on stabilizing their workforce and encouraging workers and families to move to the area. So um, again, in the second phase, we see a growing demand for single-family homes. but Housing affordability um, remains a pretty big issue um, because of high rent, land prices, and labor and material costs. So importantly, um, housing manufacturers focus on, for these single family homes, they're focusing on manufactured trailer and modular homes and duplexes that can be built at lower costs than more conventional stick built family homes. So it's during the second phase that these non-conventional housing options end up you know, comprising a large portion of the community housing stock. Um, the third phase, um, we really see a stabilization of the workforce and an increased demand for higher, higher quality single family homes. So suppliers and developers focus on these more conventional stick built single family homes. And so um, employees and families with enough assets that really plan to stay in a community for the long term will start to transition into these higher quality, more conventional single family homes. But those that are perhaps um, undecided about their length of stay in the community or um, with more limited financial assets, they remain in these trailer um, multifamily or manufactured type homes. Um, importantly, in the communities in our research area in the Bakken, none of, none of the communities have really transitioned into this third phase yet. So. Um, a little bit just about the housing in these communities before oil, the oil development really kicked off. Um, in the North Dakota and South Dakota communities in the research area, quality and availability of housing were concerns before the boom. And oil development has really increased um, the housing pressures in both states. Um, also, in the last two decades, we're seeing that the housing stocks have really remained relatively stagnant with very little um, new housing development. These communities are largely rural with, um, that have experienced a lot of um, out-migration in recent decades. And so with few exceptions, the new housing construction um, that has taken place in these communities has been 
um, largely manufactured modular or trailer. Um, so just a couple examples. This is some dilapidated housing in Lemon. Um, you know, the quality really is an issue in the communities in North Dakota and in the South Dakota communities. Um, this condition and worse were really not uncommon to see um, in, uh, in the research communities. Um, this is uh, Main Street in Ray, North Dakota. This is, um, Ray is kind of a typical small town. So even after the boom, this is the main drag through town. So even after the boom, um, housing really hasn't changed a whole lot, housing-wise construction of any kind. So even the new houses that have developed, um, you know, back to the, the cycle of housing that we just talked about, um, they've been largely trailer, trailer, modular, or manufactured. So um, this is a, an RV park in Belfield. So again, um, when the oil and support industry needed worker housing, um, when the boom really kicked off, they needed it quickly. And so these, um, this is just one example of an R RV park that should have been, um, should have provided temporary housing, but it's actually uh, been used over the long term and it's still used in many places still today. So um, this is another example. This is new housing development in Belfield. So these um, these are not stick-built homes. These are even now new construction that is taking place is primarily like these homes, primarily manufactured uh, and modular. And again, this is Belfield as well. So this is another example. These are um, really lovely manufactured homes. Um, but again, the, they remain prohibitively expensive. So even um, trailers and manufactured homes, the, the rent is so high, they still um, aren't accessible for most, for most folks. So um, this is just another example from Buffalo, South Dakota. You can see modular and trailer housing there. So um, finally, this is Belfouche, South Dakota. This is one example of stick-built housing development. Again, we're really not seeing much of this at all. And when um, housing becomes available in this development in Belfouche, um, it's purchased almost immediately. So um, housing costs have risen in South Dakota with the boom, but not nearly to the extent that they have in North Dakota, where um, the price point for a single family, more conventional stick-built home um, like this um, are still prohibitively high unless you're, um, you know, unless you're more directly involved in the oil industry. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Felix, who's going to talk a little bit more about this affordability. Okay, so looking at the monthly income of essential service personnel. Now, here we have uh, shown the North Dakota and South Dakota average and entry-level incomes for several essential service categories, as well as the 30% uh, income limit. Now, if you look at it here, um, usually it's the city the civil engineers or the registered nurses um, at the average and the entry levels who have higher incomes. Um, in the context of North Dakota, what is most important is the entry level wages because um, a lot of the employees that have been attracted to the region have been those young new employees who are recent graduates who are looking to, you know, climb up the um, the, the career ladder or get some experience that have been attracted to the region. So most importantly, it's uh, these entry level 30% income limits that are more important when it comes to affordability. Now, so if you see, uh, you know, the 30% income limits, like the teachers are roughly around $800, uh, the police detective is around 1000 and the highest would be, like I said, for like civil engineers, which is around $1,300. Um, same way looking at South Dakota, uh, you can see the civil engineers have some high income whereas the other categories have, are having some lesser income. Now comparing that to like the rental cost, um, this table basically shows the rental cost of two bedroom homes. Now we identify the rental cost for single bedroom, three bedrooms and four bedrooms as well. Now what we noticed in North Dakota is that rental usually is around $1,000 a bedroom. Now Lemon is 
the community that is most closest to North Dakota and you can see a drastic difference in rent of lemon compared to the other two communities in South Dakota. So usually it uh, averages around thousand dollars and if you go back to the previous slide as you can see you know it doesn't really meet the uh, the 30 percent income uh, limit of, you know which is usually used to measure the standard of affordability for like teachers and even for like uh, nursing assistants and you know planning aids and so on. Now in a different study we also computed like the shelter poverty scenarios which basically shows once you pay for your housing costs whether the remaining money um, is enough uh, to pay the non-housing costs and uh, that was done with uh, Dr. Bob Hearn who I see as a participant in this uh, webinar too. Uh, and in that study, uh, we looked at what would be the case if there is a household of two, cheap, two, two teachers or if there's a household of a teacher and a police detective. And it showed is that um, every scenario where there's a teacher involved, they were in shelter poverty. And, you know, and if they have kids, then, uh, you know, they, were, they would be in shelter poverty or would be uh, having to choose between living in a condensed uh, or you know in a uh, in an uncomfortable housing situation. Now, as a result, um, all of these study communities that we looked at have had to provide uh, subsidized or housing assistance to attract employees um, in all of the essential service worker categories that we looked at. Um, and uh, so, as a result, now uh, I'm going to show some. Uh, examples. Now this is basically a trailer used by a contractor to uh, as housing for his employees in Buffalo, South Dakota. Now this is basically a housing complex uh, that is used by all essential services in Watford City. Uh, this is an interesting model. Uh, it was built through uh, HIF, use of HIF funding uh, that is housing uh, incentive uh, fund. Um, then the LEPP fund, which is basically law enforcement uh, pilot program funding. And uh, this is basically managed by a nonprofit. And uh, I'll explain why this model is uh, important when we look at the community land trust model later. But so basically, the rent levels for these ones, uh, these housing uh, units are set at maximum thresholds. And for example, like the uh, law enforcement pilot program max limit for one bedroom would be like $762 and for two bedroom would be $915, which is below the uh, market available market rental levels for similar type of housing. Now, if you look at some more examples, uh, this is another trailer used as teacher housing in Belfield. Like Anne mentioned, um, a lot of the new homes that have come out, especially in communities like Bray or Belfield, are like trailers and manufactured homes. So when it comes to like really purchasing a home, uh, people don't have a lot of good options. And as a result, even the teachers, the rental options have been like these. And some of the good ones might be like this uh, duplex built for teachers in, the Bel in Belfield. And even Ray has some duplexes built uh, for teachers as well. Now, in some instances, uh, especially like the city, have had houses that they own because um, you know because they uh, because of non-payment of taxes and so on. So some of these houses have been used as housing for teachers or city employees. Now, this is an example of one of those nicer homes that are used as uh, that is used as teacher housing um, in Belfield and in uh, and Watford City also had some of these housing units that they used. Now, now these are now these options are basically focusing on rental uh, assistance to attract employees. Now if you look at uh, purchasing a home, uh, this table basically outlines um, the cost based on um, the asking prices. Now we collect uh, data, we collected data about the different homes, uh, different uh, characteristics in terms of number of bedrooms and so on for homes available in the study communities and then we calculated based on a 15 year old, 15 year fixed rate mortgage 
and a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, how much the monthly housing cost will be. Now, as you can see, even for a 30-year mortgage, the housing cost for one or two bedrooms will be about around 1,300 and for three bedrooms will be about 1,500 and you know it's comparatively lesser in South Dakota communities. A um, couple of things that I want to uh, point the attention to is basically these are the direct housing costs so they just involve principal and interest and property tax and home insurance. Now for recent graduates they might also face other uh, financial difficulties like having to pay um, student loans back or other you know other loans back as well. Now another important thing is the down payment requirements here if you look at if you look at the down payments because the new constructions are fairly expensive um, there's some hefty down payments involved in buying a home as well. Now, a lot, of, a lot of the time, the entry-level workers who come don't have the financial capability or capacity to meet some of these down payments. And if they are unable to pay, now these down payments are calculated at 20%, and if they are unable to pay those, then you have to go into an option where you incur mortgage insurance, and then that basically increases your monthly housing cost again. So even looking at both options in terms of rental houses and in terms of the ability to buy a home, um, it's evident that most essential service workers, that especially at the entry level who come to North Dakota, uh, face affordability issues. So basically the next question is then what options um, are available to uh, you know, alleviate some of these affordability issues? Now, we looked at some of the conventional USDA and FHA housing programs that are available. Um, and what it basically showed is that, like, for example, like Section 8 housing, Section 521, or Section 515 rural rental housing options, um, most of the time the essential service workers are beyond the income, lim income limits specified for these housing programs. Same way when you look at uh, housing uh, finance programs, uh, like the USDA direct housing loans, like the Section 502, or the FHA direct uh, FHA guaranteed loans, the only options usable in the context of North Dakota would be the guaranteed loans. Even in the direct loans, uh, a lot of the times, if you are experienced uh, essential service worker uh, or family or household of essential service workers, uh, you might be beyond the income limit set. Now, in terms of guaranteed loans, uh, initially. The maximum loan limit for North Dakota was around 240,000. Just basically, if I remember right, it was increased to 290,000 recently. So, guaranteed housing options are usable op usable uh, option to alleviate some of the housing affordability issues and some of the uh, some of the essential service workers that we talked about are thinking about moving into single family housing using those guaranteed housing options. Now, the second one is basically a community land trust model, which is an interesting model. There's only one community land trust model currently operating in North Dakota, which is in the eastern part of the state uh, in Grand Forks. Um, but if you look at the model, it's an approach where uh, a nonprofit um, owns and uh, owns the land, and whereas the the homeowner basically uh, owns the structure. So basically the cost of the mortgage represents the cost of the structure only and as a result uh, the cost of the mortgage or the monthly cost drastically come down. Now we calculated uh, by how much um, the cost savings would be from a CLT model. Now in North Dakota uh, uh, housing a uh, lot for housing construction ranges from somewhere between 50,000 to about 80,000. Now in South Dakota, that would be around 30,000. Now, if we look, if we use a conservative estimate of 50,000, then the savings would be on a 30-year FRM would be about 15%. And if we use a high estimate of 85,000, uh, then the cost savings per month would be about 30 uh, 30%. Now, basically, the higher the cost of land, the higher the savings from the CLT. And CLTs could also benefit from certain options like the community development block grants or tax exemptions at the state level that could further provide uh, bene benefits uh, in terms of cost savings. And in addition, um, the cost savings for the homeowners comes from 
uh, the the cost, the cost of the mortgage just representing the housing cost, the cost of the structure only, and also from property tax savings which are calculated on the structure only. Now I sh I showed a table before that basically showed how much uh, or how high the initial down payment requirements are for owning a home. So as a result. Uh, a low interest and a down payment requirement model would also help in assisting some of these uh, essential service workers who want to basically shift into a single family home. Um, we calculated if the interest rates were decreased by 1%, uh, that would result in, uh, in a 15 year FRM that would result in about a 5.5% reduction in monthly cost. And in a 30-year FRM, that would result in about a 9% reduction in the monthly housing cost. So it's definitely a usable and a contributory model to assist in uh, single, I mean, assisting essential service workers to transition into single family homes. Now, the fourth option is basically simplification of community zoning. Now, some of these smaller communities, especially like Ray and Belfield, uh, didn't have much zoning ordinances to begin with. So these communities have had to figure out zoning and uh, other ordinances as, as they, you know, as they moved forward with the oil boom. So some of these communities are still in the process of really figuring out how to simplify this and they have hired building um, or coding inspectors and so on. So really, in terms of simplifying and shortening that process and making it more efficient will contribute towards uh, speeding up of that process and enabling the supply to catch up to the demand more quickly. Now, the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency and the other state agencies have been very proactive in terms of coming up with programs like the Housing Incentive Fund, uh, stage one and stage two, the law enforcement pilot program and so on. And every community that we talk to has utilized these funds um, to make available um, rental houses or rental homes to attract uh, essential service workers. So expanding some of these programs in terms of uh, energy impact funds and surge funds will contribute towards, again, rental housing options. But in the long run, these communities will need to look at a situation where they sort of, because a lot of the, uh, like the school superintendents that we talked to didn't want to be in the business of housing, you know. So they wanted their employees to transition into single family homes in the community. So in the long run, all these communities will have to look at other options like the CLTs or the low interest model to transition these employees if like if the boom had continued to at uh, you know the level that it used to be now we will talk Jeffrey will basically talk about some of the changes that have occurred and uh, but still some of these programs like the HIF and the LEPP have been very useful in the context of North Dakota now talking about proactive state and municipal policy initiatives um, some of these options that came up was like, how could we provide some tax abatements, creative tax abatements to home builders, some technical training to contractors, especially like in South Dakota, where a lot of the contractors, or oh, there is a lack of contractors for housing construction, where a lot of contractors look at working in the oil field or undertaking oil field jobs, and as a result, um, there is a shortage of uh, contract well, housing workers or you know housing construction workers in order to undertake some of these construction projects so some of the technical programs could go a long way in educating these contractors and creating more workforce in the uh, industries around uh, um, housing construction now i mean i will stop with that and if there is more um, if there is questions then we can definitely talk about some of these issues in more detail now I will hand it over to Jeffrey to talk about the current situation and how things have slowed down and changed with the drop in oil prices. Well, all right. So uh, indeed, the current situation is is in a lot different than it has been in the last couple of years. Uh, I think it's clear that the bust, or at least some form of the bust, is upon us. Um, and you know, something that which really illustrates the 
the catch-22 that a lot of these communities are in for when it comes to natural resource extraction is that you have this boom of activity, but you know that um, it's probably not sustainable uh, in the future, and you have this this boom in housing demand, but it, you know that that housing demand may not stick around, um, and, and it's hard to predict when uh, when the slowdown will occur. Um, I think you know if you look at the the rig counts in North Dakota, I think they're down by 60 or 70 percent what they were at the peak. Um, so there's still a fair amount of drilling that's occurring. It's just that it's way lower than it was uh, in the last couple of years. Um, the you know the break-even uh, point for for production in the Bakken is thought to be um, you know 30, 40, 50 dollars a barrel range, um, and the price of oil is is somewhere in there right now. And but it doesn't seem most of the the sort of predictions that you see from uh, investors and so on is that you know oil prices will not be going up anytime soon, um, and so we have this interesting situation where you know we we may even have a housing surplus at this point right now. However, um, uh, housing and housing prices have declined at least from the the sort of the emerging data that we have. However, they have not de declined. Um, Sort of commensurate with the with the drop in demand. So for people who were struggling to find housing, find affordable housing, I think the struggle continues, even though that there's a surplus of housing um, in in the current situation. And I guess you know the longer term questions. Um, there's a saw a lot of stories in the in the press about how they continue to build houses in North Dakota because a lot of these houses have been you know slated in the Contracts have been signed to to build this this housing. Um, so you know those sort of the existing housing in the pipeline continues to be built. However, um, there's probably not demand for a lot of these new houses. Um, we know that drilling will pick back up again. Um, it seems clear that there's you know plenty of oil still in the ground. Uh, we seem to have lost Jeffrey. Um, on the audio, I'm wondering if uh, while we're I'm, kind of... I'm back. Okay, Scott, I think I'm back. Uh, okay. Yeah, I lost connection there. So, um, so I guess uh, you know the the drilling will pick back up again, but when it's hard to say. It, you know, the the oil investors, uh, people who look at long term trends, you say five years maybe um, is is when the the oil price might come back up again. There's a lot of different factors at play, and a lot of it's pretty unpredictable. So what's going to happen to this this um, large um, surplus of, of housing that has come online um, in in the interim? Um, you know, it's sort of an interesting uh, period in time right now, and I think definitely something we don't know a lot about, which is what will happen to this this housing. Um, I think anecdotally, in other places that have gone through declines. Um, you see a lot of this housing change hands as people, as you know, for, foreclosures happen, as um, as people try to recoup their investments but are unable to. Um, and so what will be the status of, of all this housing, uh, you know, let's say five years from now when, when the demand is high again? And, um, you know, I guess what are the long-term implications for, for, for people who are not recouping their investments on, on some of this housing? Uh, so it's it's sort of an interesting um, you know period of time right now for for housing in these energy impacted communities um, to to see you know what the future may hold um, and sort of interesting time for uh, some additional research um, into the housing question. So I think that is the end of our presentation, um, and I think we'd be happy to, to take some questions. Well, there are a couple questions already, so um, maybe um, folks can look at that. I'm thinking maybe um, Anne Janad might want to answer the first one, um, and maybe Lynette would be the second one, but I'm not sure. You guys uh, can jump in. Well, I guess, uh, yeah. yeah, go, for go it. ahead, Anne. No, I was deferring uh, to you, so please. Okay, uh, looking at Anne's question, were the programs that were for essential employees managed by the employers? Yes, 
um, like I mentioned before, like the school superintendents, the uh, city administrators, or you know, uh, city auditors were basically managing the houses that were provided for employees, and they really stated that they didn't want to be in the business of managing housing, so they really wanted to transition these employees out of these units that were provided for on a on like mostly they were like on a one year lease agreement and they wanted like a lot of these school superintendents or city employees wanted their employ employees out of these homes by the end of the period. But then again, there wasn't a lot available when the activity level was high for these employees to transition into. And the second question is, do you think manufactured homes are used because they could potentially be moved? I think that was more of a question in terms of the construction period available. Like if you um, look at North Dakota weather, which has been a major sort of a challenger in terms of, uh, you know, the construction cycle, you only have like a five to six month window, but this year it has been really good. I mean, we haven't had snowfall yet, which is awesome. But um, so because of that, the housing uh, window, I mean, the window available for housing construction is limited to five, six months. So basically the contractors have been trying to put as many houses as possible on the ground and manufactured homes have been one of those options where you are able to put uh, house on the homes on the ground quickly. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of these manufactured trailer homes have been used in new construction. I think that's probably accurate, but I do wonder if that does present an opportunity in the bust to, you know, affordably shrink the you know, supply so you don't get uh, areas where there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, tax reverted or abandoned housing. It's hard to say yet. Now, I live in Dickinson, which is sort of like the second uh, biggest hub city in the western in the area. Now, what I have seen happening here in the last month, and again, going back to the housing cycles that we talked about, in all of these communities, the communities were in a situation where they were transitioning from, and I think this will sort of answer a question about what is the current status of man camp housing. Now, all those communities were in a status of transitioning from two to three. So a lot of these communities were transitioning from, okay, getting rid of man camps or really being strict about um, enforcing the rules and regulations on man camps so that they were phasing out some of the ones that were not meeting the regulations and so on. So all the communities were in a situation where they were transitioning to the stage two of the cycle or beginning to look at the stage three. So really a lot of rental units have come up um, or come online in these communities in the last couple of months. And I'm seeing a lot of single family homes come out in the market as well. And it seems that the single family homes right now are sitting in the market where people are just waiting to see whether the price will drop further. And some of the people who were in like trailer homes and so on transitioning into rental units because the rental rates have dropped by about 200 to $300 across all bedroom types in these communities. So some of the people who use uh, who used to live in like hotel rooms or trailer homes are transitioning into rental units and it seems that people are just sitting and waiting to see whether the prices go further down on single family homes before they buy. So I see a lot of homes, um, you know, advertisements for homes for sale and so on that are kind of like repeating. But it's really early to see whether the bus will really be a considerable matter where they, where they will have to think about moving some of these manufactured homes that they have moved in. Okay, and I think there is a, you know, some, a couple more entries that came in uh, on, on the chat. Uh, one about uh, land trusts. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm yeah, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce the, per, the the person's name. If it's Ronnie, I apologize if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. But um, so uh, Felix mentioned that there's some um, Dakota land trust or there's some land trust activity happening out in Grand Forks. But of the six, oh good, I'm glad. Um, of the six study communities, um, the 
um, that we that we looked at out in western North Dakota and western South Dakota, actually Belfouche is the only one that had any land trust activities at all. And at the time of this research, they had really they just started their program and they only had one house uh, enrolled. Um, the 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 folks that they're working with, um, it's this group out of Deadwood, South Dakota called Dakota Land Trust. Um, and they're active in South Dakota, and that's, as far as this re research goes, that's, the, that's um, the only group that I'm aware of that's really doing much. Um, in Belfouche, um, the sense was that the limited activity was obviously due to the fact that they had just started up, but also there's this like community education piece that's really missing, so folks just don't know. Um, people who might qualify, the sense is, is that they don't even, they don't know what it is to know to ask for it. And, um, and when I was conducting interviews in the other communities, I asked um, other um, city officials if they're aware of anything like this that could be available to them. And everybody, for the most part, just wasn't, didn't even know what it was. So I think that you know, where it is available, the education piece is missing. Great. Um, one more question. You know, when, uh, when I last visited Fargo, which was, of course, during the big Still, still a uh, boom time. It was before oil prices had really dropped. So it was a couple of years ago. Um, <clears throat> they were talking about the the the, uh, the extraction workers uh, moving to North Dakota, but not the Bakken region. So they would move their families to Fargo, and then they would commute back and forth to Fargo. And I wondered if if you saw a similar type of behavior for the essential service workers. And, you know, there might be kind of different implications of that. If you're a, a teacher, all of a sudden, you don't, you know, there's maybe some reluctance to uh, do anything weekend or late in the day if you're, you know, doing four, kind of four nights in, in uh, the Bakken and, and uh, three nights in, in uh, Fargo. Or, you know, a medical, medical provider all of a sudden doesn't want to be on call things like that. Is, is, is that uh, behavior or something that you notice among those workers or not? Um, if you look at the regional level impacts of uh, shale oil development, you definitely see this hub and spoke model come into play, where certain hub cities, like say for example in western North Dakota, uh, the two biggest hub cities in the western part where the oil activity was high would be Dickinson and Wilson and Watford City is kind of growing up to that level as well. And you also have Minot and Bismarck in the mix. Now, what I did hear from some of the workers was that they had some families in Bismarck uh, because the housing like in areas like the hub cities that were considered were like in Wilston and even in Dickinson was like really expensive. So they were looking at not Fargo because it was kind of a little bit far away, but um, the options that came into play were like Minot and Bismarck where they had some families and they would go back during the weekends and so on. Um, so yeah, I mean, I had a couple of people talk to me that they had family in Bismarck, but other than that, the hub and spoke model when it comes to essential service workers were not in play because the housing in the hub cities were expensive as well. Now, I suppose with the slowdown in the activity and the drop in prices, that might be more of a factor because an employee might want to move his family to Dickinson or to Bismarck or Minot while he works in Stanley or Tioga and so on. But Fargo would be a little bit of a far stretch because you know it takes about four and a half hours to drive from Dickinson to Fargo, it takes about six hours to drive from Wilston to Fargo. So Fargo might be a bit of a stretch, but definitely communities like Minot, Bismarck, and Dickinson might come into play with the reduction in level of activity. Okay, thanks. Jeffrey, did you want to talk about the shrinking housing stock? Yeah, if I could just uh, pick up on the, the discussion, Scott, you mentioned this might be a good opportunity for that, for, you know, some of these RVs and mobile homes to be, um, you know, taken away and for the, for the population to move into sort of better and more permanent housing. And I guess, you know, anecdotally from other places where there, there have been these busts, I think that that does occur, but it's a long, sort of messy, painful process as, you know, people because people, you know, that trailer home is owned by someone who invested their money into in, into living there, and and 
you know, people don't want to give up their investments, um, especially because, you know, maybe drilling might pick up again. So you try to hold on. And so I think that it'd be an interesting opportunity for, for some sort of coordinated effort at, you know, a community level or even a regional level to sort of aid in this transition um, and shrinking of the of the workforce or shrinking of the housing stock, um, but you know, sort of absent that coordinated effort, I think it's. I mean, it's it's again sort of a, a painful and messy process that will likely take years um, for for that to occur. Uh, it's it's something that uh, you know it's hard for people to look beyond the boom when it's happening to put in place um, structures to make that. Um, not, not not built structures, but you know mechanisms to uh, to think beyond the, the boom and how that might uh, allow them to you know keep a improve their community. Uh, Anne Zeroth had a question, a comment there. Um, if the employment declines, household income is probably down as well, so they're less likely to move to more costly housing. So that's obviously part of it as well. Um, so. You know, a lot of a lot of things going on very quickly during a boom bust cycle, and um, I don't think we're quite where we need to be as a society in figuring out how to handle them uh, because they're going to continue to occur as we move forward. The uh, I think we're running out of questions here, so folks have already started to fill out the the summary. Um, so please do that, and we'll uh, get those results back to the, the presenters in the next couple of days. And I want to thank everybody for, for a really interesting discussion and documentation of kind of the status of, of things out there and, and thinking of some good uh, stimulating questions for future research.